Well, bless the Lord. Good songs, good special music, good praise service. Thank the Lord for that. In fact, Doug Parker come off stage. Because, you know, sometimes you just need a good praise service. He said, man, that felt good. That's like a good spiritual shower, you know, just all refreshing, make you feel better. Sometimes you come to church, you don't feel like it. But you, I hope you never let that rule you. In fact, we're going to talk about lazy. So let's pray. <laughs> This probably won't touch anybody in here, but we'll share this message anyhow. Amen. Father, we do thank you for life, and we thank you for your great salvation. Lord, we, we thank you that your love has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for forgiveness of sins. Lord, we thank you that we've been given a measure of faith, that we have the ability to believe and trust you, that we can experience you 24-7. And Lord, that we might reflect your love in us to others, Lord, as we touch, we serve, we care, we pray, and do those things that you'd called us to do. So, Master, have your way. Be glorified in our lives. Bless this time, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless the Lord. Please be seated. You know, in the beginning... We're going to go way back in the beginning. You know, God created heavens and earth. Let me read this, some scriptures to you out of Genesis. Genesis chapter 2 says this. And so the heavens and earth were completed and all their heavenly lights. Well, if you get out and count the starts, that's a lot of work. And by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day, listen to this, from all his work, which he had done. He re so the thing that God does is called work. So work is a good thing. You know, in fact, I think we have a generation coming up and it seems like in this country right now, nobody wants to work. It, it's sad our economy's kind of in a shambles and there's 11 million jobs out there that are having a hard time filling. People just don't want to work. They don't see the dignity of work. There's, uh, you, you take care of yourself. You're not dependent on others. You make your own way. And, and plus when you work, you benefit somebody else. It's the whole idea of work. But God saw what he did was called work, which he had done. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it sanctified it because on it he rested from all his work which he had which God had created and made. So God called the creation work and he also rested. And by the way uh, uh, there was a Sabbath rest. By the way you know most people think the, the Sabbath is the day you go, go, to, go to church. Good day to go to church. But the Christians make call the Sabbath the first day of the week. And the reason they celebrate the Sabbath on the first day of the week instead of the last day of the week is because that's when Jesus rose from the dead. So we celebrate the resurrection and celebrate a newness of life. And there's a theological debate about what Sabbath should you observe and all that. And, and the truth is, you should enter that rest every day. If you have faith every day, you cease from your works and you trust God and you do what you're supposed to do. Uh, you're in an eternal Sabbath. This is the last day and we're waiting for Jesus to come and end all this that is going on and that's going to happen. But anyhow, in, 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 our, in our life, we're to walk by faith. We're to do what you know to do. You know, we're called unto good works. We don't earn our salvation, but because of the grace of God, how can you be filled with the love of God and not do something good for other people? That's what love does. You know, the Bible says that even sinners love those that love them. You know, love's in the world, uh, but perfect love came through Jesus Christ. And it's the undefiled love. It's pure love. And and love, love is actually, uh, the, uh, there's a nature that does love all the time. Okay, I don't know how else to say that any other way. You know, uh, we have the, we're partakers of the divine nature. Well, Jesus had that nature, and everything he did was right. Because love can't do wrong. People can judge it as wrong, but love's motive is always for the benefit of somebody else. Love isn't selfish. It reaches out and touches people. Well, Jesus did what he did, said what he said for our benefit. He preached what he preached. He told the truth for our benefit. He was the truth. He knew the truth. He wasn't sharing that for himself. He was sharing that for us, that we might walk in that perfect love, that we might inherit eternal life and be filled with the love of God. And it cost him his life, which he willingly laid down. And Awesome thing. Awesome thing. You know, today's uh, the 21st year after 9-11. And you think about that event, pretty traumatic event. There's little events like that to go on all through, all through life. But that was a major event, got everybody's attention. 
And here's buildings on fire, going to collapse. And we have men, we call them firemen and policemen, who, you know, they wanted to fund, need to pay raises. But anyhow, charge into those buildings. You knew you might not come out of there. They, they knew that. They tried because they cared about people. They had a lot of love. And it was their duty. They were not lazy. They rushed into that. People are running the other way, and they're running out, and they're running in, you know. Uh, it's what love does. But what can I say? And, and I pray that you're motivated by the love of God, and everything you do in your life is out of love, and that you care about people, that you're not selfish, that you're don't, not looking for that pat on the back, or for everybody to think just how wonderful you are, except you just glorify God and that you do what you do. But anyhow, that's in... And everything. And by the way, I sure enjoyed uh, Pastor Gary doing the baby dedication. Sound more like a marriage. I do, I will, and you better. <laughs> yeah, that's come across very good. But anyhow, I want to talk about. Uh, I got a name for this message. You don't have it up here, but it's, uh, sluggard. It's an old way of saying lazy. Somebody lazy. And uh, uh, I want to read you the, uh, 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 the, the scriptures out of Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. And by the way, since most of you don't have your Bible, I would hope you have a Bible on your cell phone. If you carry a cell phone every day and you're a Christian and you don't have a Bible on it, put one on it. You can probably download them for free, like my version. And you can get the King James, New American Standard, the NSV. You know, all these are all on there. You know, you know I, I always carry my Bible. And one reason I carry it is to remind you, even if it's on your phone, it's still the Bible. It, it's... it's uh, 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 ordained of God. It's inspired by him. The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible through men. And it's the most incredible book in history. And Jesus Christ is the most incredible man in history. In fact, just to go back to this for a second, if you've never been born again, if you haven't given your heart to Jesus, if you haven't entered the faith, you need to do that. Okay, you don't need to do that because I said so. You need to do that because truth says so. Reality says so. What do you, again, and my, my question to anybody I talk to today is, what do you do with Jesus? This man lived 2,000 years ago. All the prophecies concerning him, which are many, he fulfilled every prophecy. You go to court, you could go to the Supreme Court, and, and it's going to be proven. Jesus is the Christ of God. He is sent to save us. And he walked this earth. And if he is who he said he was which is the Son of God, the Christ, our Savior, God in the flesh, God revealed. you got to listen to Him. It's not optional. Do you understand? God made all this, and it's His. You're His. No, I never gave my heart to Him. Well, He gave you free will. You can say no, God. You can walk away from God, but you're still His. You know, if my children run away from home and don't want to live with me anymore, they're still my children. They might not listen to me and might not even like me, but they're still my children. We're the Lord's. You understand? He created us. All creation bears witness of that. In fact, let me, let me pair, put it in some real modern terms. If you can look around at this creation and don't believe in God, you're stupid. Something's wrong with your brain. You are drawing conclusions that you cannot draw. Somebody hung all those stars. Somebody created all this. Somebody lit the sun on fire in a vacuum that burns forever. Got it coordinated that the earth, the earth revolves around the sun. The moon revolves around the earth. This thing is so orchestrated, it's unbelievable. And if you think, well, there's no God, that just happened by a bang. You know, you know I'd like to be you know, a, a, a dignified pastor and use elegant words. But the truth is, that's stupid to think that you could blow something up and have something. I remember talking to some young men that used to work with me in, at my cycle shop and went away from college and came back knowing everything. I mean, took a couple classes, they know everything. You know, they were going to tell me how it, how it went and they're explaining to me how everything was created and all that. And I listened for a while and I said, I want you to listen to what you're telling me. Here's what you want me to grasp. You're telling me if I go down to the junkyard, and in fact, I said Lackey's junkyard. I think some of us remember Lackey's junkyard. It used to be down at Kingsford. I said, you go down to Lackey's junkyard and take a couple sticks of dynamite, light them, throw them in there, and it goes boom, and there's going to be a Cadillac. Wow, is that bright? And you want me to believe what you're telling me by you drawing little dots on the, on the paper saying, see, this is this. I said, no, it's not. 
Somebody made this place. Somebody created it. We have a creator, and his name is Jesus Christ who came to salvage his creation. And he's going to come again, and you better be ready. And it's not, you know, we're not playing church. If you want to play church, you, there's religions all over the world. Man makes religion to make you feel good. Jesus Christ came and said, unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom. You can't even comprehend the kingdom if you don't believe that, if you don't see, see that. And what's amazing, he's life-changing. If somebody's saved, if somebody says, I, you know, I'm a Christian, and they don't have any joy and they don't have any peace, I really doubt their Christianity. You can't be filled with the Holy Spirit and not have joy. Why? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. How to be in your life. So if you're still miserable, if you're hanging in your misery and you're still, I don't know about this and don't about that, jump in with both feet and find out. You know, there, you know we all know blatant sinners are going to be cast into hell. We, we know that. I think we all believe that. And saints are going to go to heaven. But it's the in-between people we're worried about. The lukewarm. The one is, yeah, I know, but I don't feel like going to church. I, I don't know. That's not really for me. And you just get all this baloney going on in your brain that's leading and guiding you in the wrong direction. And Jesus said, but he calls you lukewarm. I'll spew you out of my mouth. And let me say it again, a real sophisticated way. He goes, I'm going to puke you out. That's what he says about lukewarm. You either become a Christian or become a sinner. At least if you're a sinner, you'll have some, there's a, a, there for a season, there's pleasure in that. There's pleasure in sin for a season, but man, it comes to an end and it catches up to you and then it usually is very devastating. But to serve the Lord, to walk in faith, to grow in grace, to love one another, to love the Lord, to keep the commandments is a joy. And your life begins to work out and things happen in favor for you. God, you actually find favor with God and things work out. And when you go through a trial or through a test, you go through it upright and establishes you. you. You even find out who you are. You find out how much depth there is to you by the situations God puts you in. But don't be a, a lazy person who won't, the Bible uses, there's a scripture that says, a lazy person won't t take his hand from the dish and put it in his mouth. Like you won't even feed yourself. Well, if you're, if you're sitting in this room and you're hearing me now and you can be offended by the way I'm talking, and I can understand that. But if you haven't checked it out, if you haven't found out for yourself, is this stuff real or isn't it? You know, I dare you to do this. Lord, if you're real, show me. Reveal yourself to me, Lord. Hang on. Hang on. And he'll show you himself. He'll reveal himself to you. You're sitting here today. He's trying to reveal himself to you right now. Has the truth got a hold of you yet? What is the truth? The world don't know what the truth is. We believe the lie. Watch the news. This says this and they say that. Who's telling the truth? Well, Jesus Christ told the truth. And he said, I warn you who to fear. Don't fear a man who can take your death. Fear the one who has power over the second death. That is the Father. Fear God. Fear God. Keep his commandments and honor God. And watch what he does for you. But bless the Lord, you know, you know, I, I'm a son of a steel worker, and I've been a steel worker all my life, so I talk like a steel worker. Uh, I can't be eloquent. I don't have the vocabulary for that. But I think you understand this. I know this. I don't want to go to hell, and either do you. There is a hellfire. And it's not like, well, we die and we're not there anymore. No. It's a, listen to this. I'm quoting scripture to you. Eternal damnation away from the presence of the Lord. You know, I talk about the new telescope they discovered, and now they see that it goes, there's further than we thought. You know, God is from everlasting to everlasting. Now they see all the stars. Now they look further, and you know what there is? More stars. They look further, and there's more stars. You're going to be cast from his presence forever. It's not going to be happy days. I'm going to be, and people say, oh, you're going to be in hell with my friends. 
No, there's going to be agony. There's going to be groaning. There's going to be mourning where the worm never dies and the fire is not quenched. It's eternal torment. And probably the greatest torment is you passed up what you could have had. Jesus died to get you there and you, "Ah, I don't know if I want to do that. Good luck. Good luck. Anyhow, let me read to you. I'm going to do the sermon I prepared. Well, really, I, uh, I am absolutely burdened with that. If you don't know the Lord, and I'm not, I'm not a major evangelist. I sure don't do good evangel- evangelical messages, but I sure tell you the truth. You know, this book don't lie. It, it, it's, it's not a mushy book. It's a truthful book. I've been reading this book for my whole life. I got, I got saved when I was 30, but before I was saved, when I was a little boy, I used to read the Word. In fact, I had one of those little New Testaments that they used to give to the military, and mine had the Coast Guard on it. I used to love to read the Psalms and the Proverbs. I always read the Word. And I've been reading it for 50 years, every day. And it's still good every day. It still tells the truth every day. It shows you the way of life every day. It deals with your character and your nature every day. It's the good book. And if you read the book and live the book and have the Holy Spirit help you ingrain the book into your life, you become a good person by the grace of God. God bless the Lord. Some will, some won't. Some will hear it and some won't hear the message. So I pray that, uh, that if you're a Christian that you're not a stumbling stone to anybody, but they might see the love of God in your life. So anyhow, I should give an altar call. But we're going to do the message first. Here's a parable of the talents. And and what I want you to see is the the final conclusion, the mastery. You know, you you can look at this as a businessman who hired people. That's the example we're using. But it's really the father dealing with us. He's granted us intellect. To each is given a measure of faith. I can't believe to each is given a major, major faith. You have faith. You might not have miracle working faith, or you might not have, you know, raise the dead faith, but you have enough faith that you can believe in Jesus. You have enough faith to grasp the truth. If you didn't have faith, how can you cross the street? Why, you look around and you believe it's safe and you walk across. That's called faith. You walk in faith. You get up every day and you go to work. You're walking in faith. Every, you, you have a measure of faith. It's been given to us. We have the ability to believe. But believe all the right things you need to believe about salvation. But let me read this parable that Jesus spoke. And again, if you want to follow along, I, I pray you have a, on your cell phone, you have a Bible. If you don't, when you go home today, download one. If, if, they, if they're going to charge you for it, I'll pay for it. Elder Michael, take it out of your pay, but we'll, we'll get it paid for. You always see a little deduction there, and they'll say, they'll write you things. Oh, there are free ones? <laughs> boy, boy, are you, are you treading water? You backpedaling out of that one. Thought I had, thought I had them. For it was just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his ability. By the way, God will not tempt you beyond what you're able. You never have to, people say, I'll die for Jesus. Don't worry about it. You don't come to church for Jesus. How are you going to die for him? Like, uh, boy, don't flatter yourself. If you can't pass the little test, yeah, I'm going to die for Jesus. I'm going to, yeah, you sure you are. Peter thought the same thing, and he was pretty macho. He denied the Lord three times. Then he finally died for him. And he went on his journey. The one who had received the five talents immediately went and did business with them and earned five more talents. The same way was the one who had received two talents earned two more. But the one who received one talent went away and dug a, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and by the way, let's pause this. You can spiritualize this. Jesus grants you grace. He gives you ability. He shares the truth with you. He gives you some truth. What do you do with it? So we can look at it that way. But still, even in the natural. Now after a long time, the master of the slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have earned five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. 
You are faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have earned two more talents. And his master had said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. It's like, you walk in faith, you grow in grace, come to heaven. We could say it that way. But still, there's more to this. But now listen to this. But the one who received the one talent also came up and said, Master, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. And I was afraid, so I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you still have what was yours. Now listen to his master here. And this could be Lord talking to us, but listen to what his master is. His master answered and said to him, listen to these nice words, you worthless, lazy slave. You worthless, lazy slave. Why does he call him that? He didn't do what he knew he should do. He was afraid. He was worried about wrath instead of doing right. But when I read that, you worthless, lazy slave, did you, did you know that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I do not scatter seed? Then you ought to have put my money in the bank and on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take the talent away from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For whoever has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. And throw the worthless slave into the outer darkness in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? He didn't do what he knew to do. Everybody knows if you put money in the bank, you get interest. It's a matter, go down to the bank and deposit the money, and it might have saved his life, but he didn't even do that. He functioned out of fear. He was trying to cover his butt. He didn't do anything that was beneficial. And I pray in our lives that we, with the grace you have, the talent, and, and everybody has a different grace and a different talent. You know, we, have, we just have two singers come up and sing. That's your gift, sing. Sing to minister, minister in your gift. We have people who serve, in fact, there, there are ladies in this church who, if I don't ask them to do something that needs done, they get offended with me. We, we want to do, that's what we do. Let us do, let us do our, and when they say do their, do their job, I don't pay them, they, just, they do it. We have people that do that, people who are just uh, wonderful servants. You know, we have people that are faithful at church. You're a faithful church member, it's what you do. There are people here, when that door's open, they're here. Boy, those kind of members are the foundation of the church. It's just awesome things. But you just do what you know to do. Don't be spiritually lazy. This is a natural example. But you can be lazy like, ah, uh, I don't feel like going to church today. I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll go next. I'll, I'll, I'll watch it on YouTube. I'll, I'll pick it up on the Internet. I mean, we always, we always want to yield to I don't feel like it. You can let I don't feel like it ruin your life or you can just get up and overcome it. You know, there, there's lives that are told, like, you know, like, if you don't get eight hours of sleep a night, you, you know, you won't be healthy. Well, some people sleep too much. There's a lot of people don't do eight hours a day, eight hours a night. You know, if you're neglecting doing what you, what's your responsibility to do, you're blowing it. You know, you got a job, get up and go to work. Well, what, I don't feel like it. Well, who, feel, who feels like it? What does this feel like it? What do you guess? The biggest thing to overcome is not the devil. Probably the biggest thing to overcome is I don't feel like it. I don't go to church. Well, I don't feel like it. I don't read the Bible. I don't feel like it. Well, hmm. So you want to be motivated by the Holy Spirit? Well, and God tells me, He's not going to talk to you. You're too lazy. You think, see what He says about lazy, lazy people? You worthless, lazy slave. You won't pick up the book and read it? You want me to inspire you to do that? I already told you to do it. Nobody has to wake you up to, to eat. <laughs> I bet you don't miss supper or breakfast. You know. Don't fall into that trap of waiting till you feel like it. <clears throat> Listen to these wonderful scriptures. Like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the lazy one to those who sent him. Ooh. 
Go to the ant, O sluggard. Observe her ways and be wise. Ants are diligent workers. Do you understand there's dignity in work? There's prosperity in work. There's profit in labor. Your work, God will bless you. Listen to these. How long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing. But the soul of the diligent is made fat. And we're not talking about gaining weight. He prospers. The way of the sluggard is a hedge of thorns. And the path of the upright is a highway. Are you one of those people where no matter what you try to do, there's always a problem? Do you know that you're there to overcome the problem? Not to be defeated by the problem? A friend of mine and myself were working on an airplane. It's my airplane. And there was a flywheel on it that we had to get off. And it's, it's pressed on. It's on a tapered and tightened. And we got a puller on there. And, and it just won't come off. We banged on that thing for 20 minutes. And it won't come off. We heated it. We did all the tricks that you're supposed to do. And we're standing there. And I don't know if my buddy said it or I did. I don't remember. It might have been him. He says, gee, we forgot the most important thing. I said, what's that? We didn't pray. I said, geez, how can we do that? Lord, help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Honest to God took a hammer and tapped it and it fell off. I mean, we, things like that happen. I, I know you, you mechanics, uh, you need a bolt a certain size and you know you don't have one, but you look anyhow and you find one. Ron, you ever do that? <laughs> Say, where'd that come from? I don't know. I don't know if it's a miracle or what, but stuff works out for people who don't just quit, who press through. Who's driving? I, I pray, you know, I pray your whole purpose in life is to make heaven. You know, come, you know what coming to church is all about? You're prepping for that. You're getting ready to make a journey, first class, escorted by angels to heaven. That's what you're prepared for. You know, sometimes I don't know if we talk enough about hell, but if you ever, any of you ever, ever get a book called Josephus in there, he has a discourse on Hades. In fact, I can get you a copy of that. Read that. When Jesus tells the story about Lazarus and the rich man, how the ones, they, they both die. And, and, and in hell, the rich man is by the lake of fire and he's in torment and he wants a drink. And, and across, the, there's a big gap. And across there, there's uh, the poor man's in the bosom of Abraham. And he's saying, Lord, have him send some water just touched my tongue. That's how miserable it is. And he said, you know, in this life you had good things, he had bad things. Now he has good things, you have bad things. But uh, there is a heaven, there is a hell, uh, and it's where you're going to abide. You know, there's going to be a judgment day. There's going to be a day uh, and a, resur a rex resurrection day where all good and bad, everybody's going to be raised from the dead and there's going to be a judgment it's going to be the good people on the right and the goats on the left. And to the good, good people, to the ones who walk in faith, who know the Lord, who've done good things and walk in love, he says, enter in my good and faithful servant. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was lonely and you visited me. And the ones on the right will say, when did we ever see that? Or the ones on the left. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. So you got to have a relationship with the Lord internet relationship with you. He put out his hand, reached out to you through Jesus Christ. And that's the only way you can get to God. You can't do it by being good because you can't be good enough. You can't do it with a false religion because it just doesn't get it there. It comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You could come to church here, but if you don't know the Lord in your heart and you don't trust him, doesn't make, because you're here doesn't make you a Christian because you go to a Christian church. You're a Christian because you trust the Lord, you walk in faith, you do what you believe you're supposed to do that you're not a sluggard, you're not lazy, that you do what you're supposed to do. Anyhow, the sluggard buries his hand in the dish and will not even bring it back to his mouth. The sluggard does not plow after the autumn, so he begs during the harvest and has nothing. The desire of the sluggard puts him to death, for his hands refuse to work. You know, we have whole communities now of homeless people. 
And a lot of people think they're homeless because, well, a lot of them are on drugs or screwed up. Some of them are mental cases, but a whole lot of them have chosen that lifestyle. I don't know if you all know this story, but in Wharton, we had an agency that wanted to take care of the homeless people in our area. And we have a number, we had a number of them around. And we're in that meeting. I was with Elder Mike in that meeting. And uh, we leave at me. He goes, you know, I got to check this out. I said, what are you going to do? I'm going to go visit him. So Elder Mike took off and visited. In this area, he probably visited, I'd say, five homeless people, maybe 10, because there's just not that many. It's not like Los Angeles or San Francisco. But he went and talked to every one of them. You know what they wanted? Nothing. They wanted left alone. They liked their lifestyle. They didn't want to work. They knew how to get by without working. Most of them were just lazy. Well, some of them on drugs, yeah. Some of them have little mental issues, yeah. But they still, they didn't want help. You know, we can do this, we can do they, they didn't want it. Sometimes it's a chosen lifestyle. They refused to work. You know, there was a day in this country when we were more Christian, for you to get welfare, you had to work. Put you to work. And then they gave you money. But you had to work. You had to work on, you know, they wouldn't just give you money. Now we just give you money. Give you cell phones. We just, do you understand they're buying votes and they're destroying our society? Work is a good thing. We're called to work. The thing that God did, he called work. You work and you prosper. Boy, I love that up here. By the way, my photographic memory, you know what's there, what you're seeing, it's also there. So you say, boy, that old guy's pretty sharp. Look how he remembers where he's at. No, I look up there, I see Proverbs 20, verse 4. I just read that one. Uh, the sluggard says, listen to this. I, I love this. There's a lion outside. I'll be slain in the street. I can't do it because. I would have done it, but. I don't have the money. I don't have the time. I don't have the, there's always, always an excuse. The sluggard always has a reason why he didn't do it. And he becomes a master at giving you the reason why he didn't do it. Instead of overcoming, you know, Christians have overcoming power. What do you do? You overcome the thing that keeps you from doing what you're supposed to do. And you do it. How about this one? I passed by the field of the sluggard and by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. Hmm. Hmm. And behold, it was completely overgrown with weeds. Its surface was covered with weeds and its stone wall was broken down. Now, here's what the wise men did. When I saw, I reflected upon it, and I looked and received instruction. What instruction you receive? Take care of business. Don't let your things fall apart. The wall's falling down, put it, fix it up. Plow the field. Do what you're supposed to do. Learn from seeing what a sluggard accomplishes, which is nothing. He accomplishes poverty. He accomplishes always wanting a handout from people. He's the one who calls you up, you know, uh, I can't get alone. Will you co-sign for me? You know, you know, I met the guy a week ago. There's something wrong there. If all his family already said no, he's already been through the whole realm. Don't say, oh, I'll be a good Christian. Sign for him. No, you, the Bible says don't co-sign, by the way. If you co-sign for somebody, you are responsible for the debt. And if you don't have the cash on hand to be able to pay that debt, don't co-sign. Because when he don't pay, guess who pays? And if he needed a cosigner, guess what? He don't have good credit. That means he's a bit lazy or a sluggard or whatever. So don't cosign. And if you, and if you loan him money, give it, not expecting it in return. And God will bless you for that. If you want, if you got the money and you want to give it to, yeah, I'll pay you back. Say, nah. If you want to, you can, but don't worry about it. Scripture, give, give without expecting, loan without expecting in return. You know, you cancel their debt, he cancels our debt. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad of that. I like, I like this. This scripture here, I was in Indonesia with a guy named Jim Hodges who was a teacher at Christ for the Nations. And everybody was quoting scriptures. He's, and we say, oh, come on, anybody know a scripture that nobody else knows? Like, got one. And he said, yeah, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Surely your poverty will come. He quoted that. That is the scripture. Don't love sleep. Don't love rest. Don't always take your ease. There's a time to sleep, but there's a time to get up. There's a time to rest and there's a time to work. Let your timing always be right. Do what you're supposed to do. 
uphold your responsibilities. Why, if you do that, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, then your poverty will come like a drifter and your need like an armed man. It's like you're going to get robbed. As the door turneth on his hinges, so is the sluggard in his bed. Can't get comfortable. But you know, you'll work at getting comfortable. You'll work at staying in bed. Anybody ever stay in bed so long like you get sore and you got to get up? I know none of us ever practiced any of this lazy stuff, right? Ah, you know, good parents. Get up. <laughs> I don't feel like I'm going to get up. I don't feel good. Of course you don't feel good. What you're saying is I don't feel like getting up. My, my mom's favorite remedy for, for that, you know, oh, I don't want to go to school today. I don't, I don't feel good, mom. Go outside, take 10 deep breaths, and go to school. <sighs> you get, you know, lightheaded by doing it, but she didn't care. She's, you know, moms, tr trust your instincts. She knew we weren't sick. Moms know when you're sick. And moms, God will give you the grace to raise your children. Don't be afraid to trust what you know in your gut. Don't be afraid of that. You know, well, what, what if I'm wrong? Now, now you're in doubt. If you believe they're not sick, make them get up and do what they're supposed to do. You know. And you're teaching them to overcome. You know, just like, you know, when you're raising children, when they're little, infants, you're training them. When they get older, you're teaching them. Now, I see parents, flip that around, I've seen parents having in-depth discussions with a three-year-old. And they're going, why? And you give, tell them why, and you go, whoa, why? They can't even understand what you're saying to them. They're playing you. They're just playing a game. And here, here's the answer for infants. I'm talking to the little guys, because I told you. Pick up your toys, because I told you to. Why should I pick them? Because I'm going to crack your butt. You're going to get a spanking. And you teach them obedience to authority first. Amen. Then you teach them understanding after they come under the authority. Because guess what? Then they might even hear you. If you don't have any authority in the life of your children, you, you've, you, you're failing as a parent. If you come to this church and you don't hear me, I'm really not your pastor. If what I say doesn't affect you, I'm probably not your pastor. I'm a pastor, and you're going to a church. But if, if what's said to you weighs on you, if you go to home today and you go, I've never looked at that book. I think I better start taking a look at it. Well, you heard, you heard something. You know, the humble are saved. The humble hear and are glad. What's the humble do? The humble is when you tell them something, they do it. It's the difference. The Bible says, in repentance and rest you shall be saved. What do you mean repentance? Uh, okay, I, I've been stealing, and I read the commandment says, thou shalt not steal. How do I humble myself? I quit stealing. That's humbling yourself. That's the humble person. A humble person obeys what they hear. But, you know, if you think you know it all, uh, here, here's a scripture for know-it-alls. Show me a man that's right in his own eye, there's more hope for a fool. It also says this, every man's right in his own eye. But you got to lay that down sometime to listen. Everybody thinks, I got it, I understand. No, no. You know, I, I, I think about this, you know, I've been, I've been golfing for 40 years maybe. Never got good, but I golf. And, and like the other day, I learned something. In fact, my, my attitude was, why wish I would have learned that 40 years ago? I might have become a good golfer. But somebody always knows something you don't know. And always... Give the benefit of the doubt. The sluggard buries his hand in a dish and is weary of bringing it out to his mouth again. I mean, you can really get lazy. I remember one time I'm, uh, I'm at a gas station pumping gas, and right across the street was the Dairy Queen. And I was watching this young man who looked like a high schooler, pretty big boy, taking out the garbage. Honestly, God, I swear it was. Hmm. I mean, it took him like 15 minutes. He should have went, you know. And then putting the garbage in and stopped and took a break. I was like, geez, I can see he's never been spanked. <laughs> you know, my mom, my, my mom, you know, any of you know that, that move? You know, got your arm when you're little, got your arm. And, and moms are fast. 
My mom, was, she is tough, though. I know I tell you stories about my mom all the time, but I remember I, she got mad, man. I told, I don't know what I did, spilled something to draw. I don't know what I did, something careless. But I don't remember, but all I know is I was wrong, and I was running because she, she, she's chasing me with her wooden spoon. She caught me. She's fast. I remember in my grandma's yard, Bergstown, running around. She grabbed me by the collar, and she didn't spank my butt. Hit my shins. I'll teach you to run. <laughs> Next time, <laughs> I didn't run. It wasn't worth it. I'd rather get hit on the butt than in the shins. Believe me, that hurt. And again, my mom's favorite phrase, when you say, Mom, I'm going to do that. No, you're not. Yeah, I'm going to do it over my dead body. And what her says, we believes her. <laughs> yeah. I've told you about my brother Tony getting a spanking when he was little. You know, she got his arm and she's spanking and he's running in circles, you know, around her. You know, take me everything. I know today, you know, uh, just give them red linen or some drug and tell them that, you know, they you got a problem. Yeah, right. This woke stuff is destroying children and, and making parents think you're doing something wrong. If you don't spank your children, you don't discipline your children, you're doing something wrong and you're not being a good parent. But anyhow, my, to finish the story, my brother Tony's jumping around like that. She goes, hold still. He wouldn't hold still. She took, put down the wooden spoon and took out a butcher knife and held it sideways and go, move now. Man, he didn't budge. He got his cup of wax and went. My mom was a little, you know. But here's a, this is a gospel truth, and I know I've shared this a lot of times. This is gospel truth. There was never, ever a doubt in my mind or my brother's mind. We knew our mother loved us. How did we know? When we misbehaved, she wouldn't let us get away with it. I remember talking to a prisoner down Monsville Prison. I used to get to go down there. I used to go down there and minister a lot. In fact, I was given access to the prison. I could go when I wanted to. The, the warden liked me for some reason, probably because I talked the language of the prisoners. But I was telling this one prisoner, he, he was really having a hassle with the guard. The guard was about to put some knots on his head. And I caught him later and says, you know, you need to listen. That man has authority, and you're giving him a bad time. It's a wonder he didn't beat you with that club. In fact, the higher authority stopped. The, the one guard was getting so mad, he, he was going to put some knots on that guy's head. And I said, you know, you're in prison because you don't listen. You know, if you probably listened to your parents, you wouldn't even be here. Your parents, your parents loved you, and you, you wouldn't listen. He says, if my parents love me, quote, this is a young man, probably in his 20s, early 20s, he says, if my parents love me, why did they let me do what I did? Sometimes bad behavior is just seeing if you love them. They want to see if you love them. Do you care enough to stop them? You know, they need some, he needed some of that over my dead body stuff. You know, and probably wouldn't be in prison. So, but discipline is good. And without discipline, you can't grow. Without discipline, you're not going to grow up. And, you're not going to grow up and become anything. Well, in the beauty of your parents' discipline leads to self-discipline, and if you're self-disciplined, you can accomplish anything you want to in this life. Amen. You can become what you want to become. You, you know, I got my grandson's a doctor, another one's a director, another one's, a, you know, we just got good things. And my, grand, my granddaughter is a mom. And I love that. She was the first one to give me great-grandchildren. So if I seem a little arrogant, because I am great, I mean, great... <laughs> My, my great-grandchildren call me great-grandpa. Now, we got a couple of the young, the girls are, in, in, you know, 17 years old. Who knows, a couple years, maybe it'll be great-great. And so, boy, I'm going to be hard to live with. You know, if some children, can, I'm trying to picture that when the children come up when they learn to talk. And, hey, great-great-grandpa, great-great, double great Something else in America been, we've been robbed of, this mentality of, oh, you don't want to have too many children because then you can't have a car and a house and we can't afford it and all that. Have children. Amen. God says be fruitful, multiply. He'll take care of the, the, the needs. You know, we, we've, been, we've been lied to. You know, Islam is trying to take over the world. The average Islam family does like five to seven children. The average American family does like one and a half. We're shrinking. You know, by the way, you know, 
Christianity came to America by white Europeans. That doesn't make a special, it was Christians came to America. It didn't matter if you came from Africa, Asia, where you came from. If you brought Christianity to, to a country and you established it based on Christian principles, it's going to work. It wasn't because we're white Europeans. Of course, Italians are kind of half, but yeah, I can identify both ways. It's nice. Right, Brother Greg? I got, I got that got from. But we, we are, our Christianity is being numbed down in America. And those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. Again, I've shared this many times. In America, the, the, the normal standard of morality was the Ten Commandments. Whether you're a Christian or not, everybody knew the Ten Commandments. Everybody knew love your neighbors yourself. You know, th th think about this. In, in, my, in my lifetime, from first grade to 12th grade, every day at the start of school, they'd read the Bible and say a prayer. And that one person got that taken out. One person. And, you know, where's somebody standing up saying, reading the Bible is not a religion, it's a book. Praying isn't, you know, the freedom of religion that we had in America is that you could practice your religion. Amen. Our founding fathers believed in religion and put it in the Constitution, the free practice of religion. But, you know, what they were talking about, Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Orthodox, Lutheran, Christian religions, Pentecostals, any, if you were, it was for the Christian religion. Our founding fathers believed that Islam and Buddhism was a false religion and not even a religion at all. They didn't regard, they didn't include that. Now we include that. Now we go Christian, Islam, Buddhist, whatever, and we, and we lump it all together and they say, you can't practice that. We need to get back to prayer. We need to get back to Bible. We need to get back and living righteously. And we got to get, get, get rid of this mindset. You know, this woman's movement. The woman's movement robs you of being a woman. Now you can be a general in the military and you can shoot people. Wow. Ain't that great? You can be like a man. You can kill people. And man, it makes you feel good. Like, see how successful I am? I killed someone. What is that? I grew up in the 50s. Nobody in the 50s thought that a woman was inferior or less intelligent than a man. No, I don't know anybody that thought that. And yet, when they talk about back in those days, you're going to be back in the kitchen. Women were in the kitchen because that's where they wanted to be. They wanted to raise their children. They wanted to be a mom and a housewife. What's wrong with that ambition? Amen. When the children are raised, go get a job if you want to. Go run General Motors if you want to. But you've got something way more important than General Motors. That's your children. And thank God for moms who are going to stay home and raise their children and make sure their children turn out right and they're going to produce good children. Man, you, that's good fruit. And you want to go, well, let's see, Marie was smart. She, she didn't, well, she got a job. Yeah, she teaches piano and, and ukulele once a week. Oh, geez, tough. Marie, I just admire your ambition there. But she just rode in a bicycle race yesterday. How many miles? 36 miles gravel. 36 miles gravel race. Uh, of all the women, she came in third. She's old too, you know. <laughs> and Doug didn't care about that. He wanted to know how, how many women, how many men did she beat? How many were there? How many men? 54 men, and she came in 16 of that. So see, there she is. One of those women, ladies. You know, good. I'm gonna prove those guys. The guy who chased her 10 miles high fighter after says, I was trying to catch you. But what I'm getting at, there's time and a place for everything. But when you've got babies, you're going to only have them for sure. I'm going to tell you, that 18, 20 years goes like that. It goes like that. And if you've been out doing your thing and proving that you can work and going to make money and, and you miss that, you raise children right, that's till you die. That's till you die. Family that loves each other is just, it's, it, 
it's great. It's awesome. But anyhow, so don't buy into that stuff. Don't buy into the lie. Don't buy in that you got to, don't have to prove anything. Be who you are. Do you realize God, the Lord formed you in your mother's womb? You are who you are. Why do you want to be somebody else? Be all that you can be. Quit. You know, I'd like to golf like Tiger Woods. Well, he's not the best one today, but I'd like to golf, but I don't want to be him. I had a tough marriage, man. Lady beat him up with a nine iron. I mean, just. See, he married an athletic, an athletic lady. That's not bright. Man. She could outrun him and everything. Wasn't she a downhill skier or something, man? Go over jumps and stuff. She's like, dummy. The dumb thing was messing around. They violated God, and God said, okay, sick him. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, and by the way, if you're a self-righteous Christian and you go, how could he do that? Hey, don't go there. Don't go there. If you're a young, good-looking man with a few million dollars in fame in your life, you don't have to chase girls. They'll chase you. I'm not saying it was okay. I'm saying just don't regard me. Oh, I'd never do that. Well, you'll never have that opportunity. So thank God for that. I don't want to, I don't want to find out if I could say no. I, I, don't, I don't even want tested in that. So, I, you know, like Peter said, I'll die for Jesus. I don't know if I, you know, I don't know what I'd do. I, I avoid that stuff. Like the plague. Right. Yeah, f- fear that flesh, man. It, it wants to overeat, it wants to oversleep, and it wants to mess around. And God says, that's a no-no. Walk in the spirit and not carry out the desires of the flesh. Bless the Lord. I got a few more of these scriptures. I might as well read them because they're good. Ah, oh, okay. 26, 14. You didn't check. 15. I read that one. The sluggard buries his hand in a dish. He is weary of bringing it out to his mouth again. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes. Listen to this. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can give a discreet answer. Wow. The slothful man does not roast his prey, but the precious possession of a man is diligence. Be diligent to do what you need to do. Uphold your responsibilities and do what you're supposed to do. In fact, here's what the scripture says. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed Handling accurately the word of truth. Let us therefore be diligent to enter his rest, at least, at least anyone fall through the same example of disobedience. Disobedience is being lazy to not do what you're supposed to do. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Spotless and blameless. Be at peace. You know, when you do what you're supposed to do, it brings you peace. There's a satisfaction to getting things done. I like work is one thing. Getting done, finished with the work is even better yet because it's, it's satisfying. And you feel good. And then you can go home and lay down and you're not like, boy, I, I should have finished that. No, finish it. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Don't be ruled by laziness. Don't be ruled by your body. Be ruled by what's right. And by way, I'll say at the same time, there are some people who are, work fanatics who need to know when to stop and go call it off. There's a time you quit and there's a time to lay down. For everything, there's a season. If you walk in the spirit and you exercise these things, you'll find the right season for everything. There's a time to sleep and there's a time to get up. There's a time to for everything in life. There's a time to dance and there's a time to refrain from dancing. But right now, there's a time to praise. So we're going to praise the Lord. We're going to have a praise service. And by the way, if anybody's here and you never gave your heart to Jesus... It's as simple as, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and make me the kind of person you want me to be. Forgive me of my sins and save me. Fill me with your spirit. He'll do that. Call on the Lord and he will save you. Bless the Lord. Father, Lord, I pray that we're not spiritually lazy, but that we're responsible human beings who take care of business and do what we're supposed to do. Lord, that we're good witnesses of your grace and your glory. So, Master, I pray that Whatever we put our hand to might prosper, that we would be in good health, that we would grow in grace, and that you would be glorified through our lives. 
that we would all have a testimony and say, look what the Lord has done. So, Father, bless as only you can. Pour out your grace abundantly in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I love you. Don't be lazy. Let's praise the Lord. Thank <laughs> you.